my mother's savage daughter, the one who runs barefoot, cursing sharp stones. I am my mother's savage daughter. I will not cut my hair. I will not lower my voice. My mother's child is a savage. She looks for her omens in the colors of stones, in the faces of cats, in the fall of feathers, in the dancing of fire, in the color of old bones. I am my mother's savage daughter, the one who runs barefoot, cursing sharp stones. I am my mother's savage daughter. I will not cut my hair. I will not lower my voice. My name is Davi Benjamin, CEO of Bridget, and I was in a tropical dry forest in a sound healing circle about six weeks ago. And that song, that song was playing. And at that moment, a plant told me that the internet has a savage daughter that's that's emerging now, that's emerging, that wants to 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 speak and express. And, and we know the feminine has been associated with truth throughout the ages. What I took from, from that experience was this, this notion that we're complex beings that are being flattened into a two-dimensional grid and then operated on by algorithms which are seeking to control our behavior and our choices. And it's taking this, this internet that's so vast and so multidimensional and making it into a two-dimensional experience where we're seeing the web as flat and static and people are being treated as commodities and information is being treated as commodities. But there's this possibility, there's this vast energy in the internet and part of it's a, a feminine truth-telling energy that wants to emerge. And, and I knew at that moment that we had to do this challenge. So this challenge is about really envisioning what the internet could be like. The web was as dimensional as the internet. My name is Fafsa. Uh, I originally uh, got started with this, looking at the ecology of um, what's happening with our data. What are we doing? What are we experiencing as it pertains to our data? And so after a 2020, a year, a year like 2020, is it crazy for us to consider one thing? Health is essential. A healthy body, a healthy mind, a healthy soul. A lot of our indigenous ancestors believe that a healthy environment is essential because those are what feed our body is the environment. And we are all products of our environment. So in this digital age, as COVID has landed, we need to consider our health of our digital environment as well. We need to consider what is the web and how does it impact our everyday lives? We brought on health and wellness experts, subject matter experts from across the world to discuss the role of the internet and what it plays in our lives. Yeah, well, really, really excited to, to have such an amazing group of people participating in this event. Uh, it is sponsored by the Forbes Fund and the Overweb Foundation, the the leads here were Bridget and Noetic Nomads. We are really pleased to, to mention that we've got a whole cadre of partners, the Next Generation Internet uh, program out of the U, Funding Box, School, WeTech Belgium, UMI, Accelerant Solutions, and Edge Riders. We're all coming together around this notion that the the web could be hyperdimensional, and what would it be like if it was? So today, we're, we're right now here in the moment of the opening session. We're gonna talk about the overweb, why we need it, 
what it is. We're going to give you some examples. We have some people here who are already working on the Ogre Web, some different applications. So you're going to hear about that. Then we're going to go into panels. These panels are really uh, focused on setting the foundation of where we're at with the web right now. We want to understand what's working, what's not, how we are being constrained by the two-dimensional grid that we're operating in right now. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the, the actual character, the nature of those panels are. But uh, for now, I'll say after the panels, there's going to be a 20-hour challenge period. And this challenge period is for you to get super inspired and to investigate what it might be like to have a hyper-dimensional web for your area of expertise, interest, or endeavor. So if you're into research, you can investigate it for research. Or if you're into dating, you can investigate it for dating apps. If you want to think about travel, art, music, whatever, you can apply this over web pattern, which we're going to talk about in a minute, to whatever area of your interest. And, and something beautiful is going to come about. We'll talk about how this has already happened in a couple of domains. So I'm, I know there's a lot of people who probably are thinking I'm just coming from the panel. And I just want to say that we really will encourage you to uh, think about participating in the challenge is not the type of thing that we're expecting that you will need to spend 20 hours at all. No, it's more like in two hours, in, in one hour, in 40 minutes, you can probably come up with a concept, something that you've never thought about and probably wouldn't be thinking about for years if you weren't here today. And it could be something that, that really gives you not only a, a better idea of where the web is going, but also some ideas about how you can play a part in building the next level of the internet. Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the next level of the internet. We're talking about a trust layer over the internet. And so in that 20 hour period, you will, if you choose, you will take several hours and with the team ideally, doesn't have to be, and just come up with some ideas about how the area of your interest could be transformed with the next level of the internet, with a trust layer over the internet. And we'll talk more about that. So then the closing session, that's tomorrow morning. And that's simply going to be elevator pitches from people who come up with concepts. So if you come up with a concept, you get to do a 90 second elevator pitch. We're super excited to see those. I already know that we're gonna have four or five of them. I've already talked to people, they know what they're working on. So, so it's, gonna be, it's gonna be really interesting and I'm gonna move on. Okay, so PJ, do you wanna jump on in here? I mean, excuse me, FASA, please bring us. Right. So, uh, and sorry again, everybody, the technical difficulties are dealt with. Uh, so the state of the web, when we consider the false claims that are happening, especially with this infodemic around COVID, uh, what do we do? There's misinformation on the web, there's disinformation on the web, and there's a lot of malinformation that's happening on the web. And that makes it extremely difficult for people to be able to know what's right and what, from what's wrong. And so the sense making being disrupted, that changes everything. It allows people to be vulnerable, it allows for people to be exploited. And when we consider things like technologies like the state of artificial intelligence and how a lot of these algorithms even used in the, uh, for, for law enforcement purposes happen to be predatory towards certain groups of people, which is always a problem. So taking a human-centered approach, things like ontological design and even the concept, which is, the, which is essentially human design and applying that to a technological uh, solution that's what's wanted and that's what's necessary so that we can have better communities. And if we consider that even on the web, this concept of a digital community, when you interact with different people on the web, that's a community. So what does it mean to have a healthy community where people can actually communicate back and forth without bots and without predatory algorithms and knowing that what you're who you're dealing with is actually a real person? These are all things that we're taking into consideration uh, with this uh, specific uh, endeavor that we're moving on. 
Yeah, and just just to add a little bit to that, these are the panels. <laughs> Maybe I didn't make that quite clear, but we're going to have a, a set of three hours of panels. You're going to have a choice at, at 10 o'clock. You can choose between the state of the web and digital communities, the future of digital mm -hmm. communities. At 11, you can choose between the state of AI ethics and people of color and the state of sense making on the web. And at, at noon Pacific, these are all Pacific times, just to be clear, you can choose between the state of false claims on the web and ontological design of the web. So uh, you wanna add anything else, Fasa, before we move from here? Uh, no, that's it. I just look forward to us moving and uh, let's get these panels started. Yeah, and I, and I do wanna just mention that we have amazing people. We're so thankful, so grateful that people like Nora Bateson, Fred Brown, Jamie Joyce, Evan McMullen, Daniel Frega, Owen Kaj, Raven Connolly, uh, Nick Adams, uh, Chibu, Joshua Armwa, Arma, so many people. There's even more. You're gonna you're gonna meet these people today. They're gonna give you a foundation of where we're at with the web, what's working, what's not, and um, how we're being constrained. They're also gonna talk about some of the hopeful signs and directions as well. So let's let's uh, move on and, and talk a little bit more about, about the overweb. So for me, this is a super exciting moment because it's, it's really been a long time coming. I, I started on this journey about three years ago. I met, I met FASA about a year and a half ago and we started intensely collaborating about nine months ago. And that wasn't the only person though as well, right? This overweb concept has been really evolved through hundreds of conversations over the past three years. And then having FASA's thought partnership plus the collaboration of the, the school volunteer design team and people working on the infodemic challenge and, and Leslie Usebank working with me on, on different grant applications. You know, we were able to really refine um, an idea of what it could look like to have a trust layer over the web and, and how it might work. The beautiful thing for me is that really not too many people have heard this. It's, it's a trip, you know. We've, we've talked to Silicon Valley and, and they're just not really interested. <laughs> you, you might notice uh, there's a, like kind of an absence of Silicon Valley on, on the partner list. And that's just, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it, really. You know, I've talked to a lot of people. I've talked to a bunch of people, VCs, et cetera. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. They're not here in this conversation yet, but everyone's gonna make it to this conversation at some point. So let's talk about it. So the, if we had a trust labor over the internet and on this, on this screen, you see the idea that here's a website, but it could be it could be an article on the web, it could be an ebook, it could be a PDF. But let's just say there's a website, and then we're gonna put a layer over on top of that. That's actually not just one layer; it's it's multiple layers. It's in as many layers as you want. And these could be these could be actually digital nations. So you could have a digital nation of the people who live in California, or a black digital nation, or people who are Buddhists, you could have dog lovers or a cannabis digital nation. You could have any kind of digital nation. These are basically people who want to come together, right? They want to come together and have a safe digital space. Um, you can also think of this trust layer as having applications. These applications would operate essentially over the web, but across the digital nations. And yeah, I know that there's a lot there. We're gonna come back to that in a little bit, but my point here is to help you see that there's this possibility of right now where right here on this page, uh, 
there's one thing you can do, right? On any one point on a web page, there's one thing you can do. You can look at a piece of text or an image, or maybe you can play a video, or this radical thing that you can do. You can click a link, and the link can take you to a whole nother world. That's actually hyper-dimensional. But the, the key thing to note is that with today's web, there's only one link at any given spot. There's only one thing that you can do. You can, like you said, you can click a button, you click a link, you can look at something. But, but in the future with these, these applications and what we call smart tags, which I'll talk about in a minute, you can have dozens, if not hundreds of things that you can do at any one given point on the web. Just imagine a photograph. Right now you can look at it. Maybe it's a maybe the photograph is a link as well. So it can take you somewhere. But imagine if with that photograph you could have access to all the supporting information for it, all the contradicting information to it, any info, any, any um, publication. Uh, that cited or used that photograph. Um, you could have a access to a video of the person who took the photograph where they're explaining what was going through their mind when they when they took that photograph. You could have, you could have, what else could you could have? You could have uh, commentary of other people about the quality of that. You could have reviews, you could have polls, you could have conversations, you could have all kinds of things attached to that photograph and that's what we're talking about and what would that mean well that would mean that we'd have annotation but we'd have a essentially an annotation layer with built-in privacy security and you know these this notion of nations and applications well here's the interesting thing here's the really interesting thing that blows my mind often so the annotation layer, it was always supposed to be in the web. In fact, it was in the web before the web was the web. 1947, Vannevar Bush, Memex, annotation was in that. 1969, Douglas Engelbart, mother of all demos, annotation was in it. 1989, Tim Berners-Lee, proposal to CERN for the World Wide Web, annotation was in it. 19, 1993, Mosaic browser created by Mark Andreessen, annotation was in it. And in 2012, Mark Andreessen, one of the top VCs in the world, said that the internet had a big missing feature. Can anyone guess what it is? <laughs> this annotation. So what happened was in 1995, Netscape was going head to head with the behemoth Microsoft, this, the biggest technology firm in the history of the world at that time. And Microsoft was preloading Internet Explorer on every PC. So Netscape was at an instant disadvantage. And so in 2012, Mark Andreessen lamented that he had to pull out annotation from, from the Netscape browser, which was, was basically Netscape was coming from Mosaic. Um, he had to pull it out of that browser because they didn't have a place to store the annotations. There was no cloud. There was no peer-to-peer. There was no blockchain. There was no way for him to store that information. They would have had to create a huge server that would need to scale to have all these annotations in it. And they're going head to head with the juggernaut Microsoft who's doing anti-competitive things by preloading the browser, a direct comp competitor to them. They had to drop it. But Mark Andreessen in 2012 said, I often wonder what it would be like, what the web would be like if we had still kept annotation, the ability to layer knowledge upon knowledge upon web pages. So that's what we're talking about. This is not a new idea. This is an old idea that's been modernized 
for 2021. This is an old idea. This is part of the savage daughter of the internet that is wanting to express this, wanting to connect everything authentically, that wants to expose truth, that wants to have a web, an internet that works for people, not the other way around. So we're talking about the next level of the internet, the over web, and let's talk about the over web pattern because that's how it, how it all really starts. Okay, so number one, the number one element of the over web pattern is safe digital space. You know when you're in this trust layer, when you have access to this over web, trust layer over the web, that everyone you encounter is a real person in good standing with the system. What that means is there's no bots, no predators, no serial abusers, there's no throwaway accounts. So if someone messes up their overweb account because they're cyberbullying somebody and they end up getting deactivated, they can't go start another account the next day like they can on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and any of these other platforms. This is completely different. This is not how the web works right now. There's no reason it couldn't. It just doesn't. So save digital space. That's element number one. Element number two of the overweb pattern is on page presence. So this is the notion that you can go visible on any web page. So I, I don't know if you heard me. You can go visible on a web page. That means that you could go to your, your website that, that you really enjoy going to, that you get information from on a regular basis, you go visible there. And then when you go visible, you can see anyone else who's visible on that web page as well. And you can see their profiles. And if you would like to, based on their profile, have a communication with them, then you can send a communication request. So imagine that you're a skier and you're interested in skiing the Swiss Alps. So you end up going to Google you, or maybe Doug, Doug, Doe, and you, you search to, to find one of, the, one of the resorts in the Alps. You go to that site, you go visible, and you notice that there's another dozen people, or maybe it's 50 people, or maybe it's 200 people that are visible at that site at that same point. And you then go look at their profiles. And as it turns out, uh, you're able to see whatever persona that they are expressing at that moment. So with that whole safe digital space that I spoke about earlier, you have one main account that's a real person account, but you can navigate the web with personas. And those personas can be visibly or invisibly tied to your main account. So I will know when I'm visible on that website in the Alps, you or I we will know that everyone else is a real person. And perhaps some of those people, because they're on a ski resort site, maybe they're using their their uh, res their ski persona. So their ski persona would have things like what equipment they have, what mountains they've they've skied, what else would they have? Hmm. Maybe it would have their favorite conditions. So maybe they like deep powder, maybe something else. And based on that information, you could decide whether you want to communicate them. Maybe they have some value. Maybe you uh, might look at them and, and see the one who's actually skied almost all the mountains in, in Switzerland. You know, that's probably someone who could really give you some advice on which mountain to ski. So this is the idea with on-page presence. It opens up everything. You'll meet people you'll never meet. Then on page interaction. So this is the notion that you're gonna get a set of smart tags. With the over web debuts, there's gonna be six or seven of them. So there'll be a, a note tag, a conversation tag, a poll tag, a list tag. There'll also be a bridge tag. A bridge tag, I gotta just give it a little bit of a plug because that's that's it really all started with the bridge tag. The bridge is 
It's like a link on steroids. It's a conceptual link between a piece of information on one page and a piece of information on another page with a relationship. And uh, that creates the possibility of having a contradictory bridge from a piece of information in a, well, let's say from a sentence in a news article and it could be a contradictory bridge to a segment of a video it could be on YouTube or TikTok where the person in the video is saying something that directly contradicts what's in the paragraph on that news site. And this is a this is a really important piece, the bridge. You 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 can find out more about it on the site, but it essentially allows for us to have the possibility of context, ubiquitous context all over the web. And that means that anywhere you go, you can have a, a 360 degree view, contextual view of everything that anyone thought was directly related to that piece of information that you're looking at. Of course, uh, that would need to be validated. <laughs> so we, we want to make sure all the relationships are correct and that the, 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 the things that people think are related are actually related to the to the things, but once it's validated, we basically have a universal knowledge map that provides for ubiquitous context. And these smart tags, like I said, you're gonna have six or seven of them come out of the box, but the online, the open source community associated with this project is gonna be able to create whatever smart tags they want. So developers can come on, they say they're working in the dating area. Okay, well, let's create a set of smart tags that are good for dating. There'll be some that are created for research. There'll be some that are created for games. There's gonna be all kinds of smart tags created in the next five to 10 years. And what- I would the, also, uh -huh. Now, I would also add that when you think about 360 degree context and you think about the different reasons that we access the web, Let's just say for health, for instance, when he says research, being able to have access to researchers that maybe study a very specific group of people, those researchers can add context to an article that you might be reading. So if you say, oh, this is really interesting. I'm reading something about COVID-19, but I'm not quite sure if this research reflects the community that I come from whether it be genetically, whether it be, I mean, for any, for any reason. Now you would have the context of understanding that there may be some bias in that research or that research might not, that, that article might not represent my community fully. And so you might want to look for, and, and on top of that, with the on-page presence, you're talking about an opportunity to meet other people that are thinking the exact same thing that you are and wondering, well, where's the content that links us to this same particular subject around COVID. And then being able to find that context because there's a community of people that are working together. So on-page presence is extremely important. And then knowing that that community of people, that they're not bots. If they're bots, then they're steering you towards an echo chamber so that advertisements can be fed to you so that you'll purchase something. You see the relationship that we have with technology right now, we look at it from a consumer standpoint and it looks at us as consumers as well. So the opportunity to be able to use the web in a way that you are not just treated as a consumer, you also produce something of value. And that thing of value that you produce, that's your data. So if your data that you produce is now creating an opportunity for you to find what it is that you're actually looking for on the web, free from the echo chambers, free from the bots, free from the algorithms that are trying to turn you into a consumer. That's what we call data sovereignty. See, right now, everybody sort of lives this data subservient uh, lifestyle on the web and we don't really understand that. When you're data subservient, it means that you create data and it's used as a way to market to you so that you can find a product. But what if you wanted to find the right product? That's whenever the data that you're creating is working for you and empowering you to make more informed decisions, which is why sense making is such an important thing. 
and why it's actually not available on the web that we're currently using right now. Building this trust layer on top of the web is essential to our health. It's essential for us to really understand and comprehend the environment that we are in right now, because we're using data to understand this environment that we're in every day. There's nonprofits that use data. There's for-profits that use data. There's governments, they use data. Hey, PJ. So, yeah. uh, I would love to get Monique in here to talk about what the EU is doing with the next generation internet program, and then have you come back and talk of about course. what else is happening. So, of course. Monique, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you so much. We're so appreciative to the Next Generation Internet Initiative. As you may know, Bridget, the source project of this whole over web um, notion, won the Next Generation Internet Award in 2019. We were the only non-European company, but uh, Monique Kalista, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Great. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Here it's uh, getting dark in Switzerland. Um, thanks for the invite and thanks for this introduction. Very inspiring, very full of, of, of uh, different points that uh, it would be great to have time to discuss more in details. But as you said, I'm here today um, to talk uh, to the people participating to this event about the next generation internet. So first of all, I'm Monique Calisti, and I'm the CEO of a Swiss company that is uh, quite heavily involved in a number of uh, initiatives that are promoted um, within the European funding co context about how to change the internet and how to make it safer, more accessible, more inclusive and uh, more resilient. Uh, we all know that, <clears throat> especially in these uh, difficult times uh, of isolation at several levels, uh, essential services have been uh, accessible only via the internet. So it's clear that um, this has created a, a, a very um, uh, fundamental um, need. On the other hand, we know that the internet that we use today is not safe, is not protecting our children, is not uh, the one that uh, we, or that, that the pioneers of the internet uh, dreamt of. So um, this initiative of the European Commission, the uh, Next Generation Internet, has been launched um, in 2017, late 2017, in order to actually gather researchers and innovators, especially small players, small companies, uh, at work for um, rethinking, rebuilding, uh, restructuring uh, the internet. Um, and there are several um, technical um, aspects that are being tackled uh, from um, search and discovery um, technologies, from um, the use of blockchain uh, for making the web more secure, um, distributed ar architectures, uh, but also a lot of open source um, initiatives that are uh, trying to create alternative tools to navigate, to work, uh, to access the internet in a, in a safer way. Um, you might, uh, I liked before um, when you said at the end of the day, technology should be the mean uh, should be a mean and not uh, the end of the journey. So they have to be part, they are part of our journey. And uh, uh, it's thanks to these technologies that we can enjoy it better. But uh, we know very well that there's, first of all, a lot of people around the world that still do not have internet access. So we are at work uh, for um, providing internet access also to uh, rural areas or to regions in, in the world where uh, this is not possible. Uh, and we are at work to transform the way the internet works today. So uh, we all know this week uh, there was a lot of noise about, you know, or last week, I, I can't remember anymore, when, when one of the instant messaging companies that were pretty much used, I won't mention them, changed the privacy policies. Uh, well, it was 
time for many of us to stop and think what do we want so what do we want from our uh, you know infosphere this 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 dimension in which we live that is not virtual not physical but it's part of our everyday life uh, we have to think what we want to share what we want to give up uh, but many times we are not given the choice so the ngi is working very much around the fact that we need more transparency and we need technologies that can um, give back, uh, first of all, control to the end users and that can provide value to the end users by um, allowing them uh, to decide how they want to use the data they produce, the data they share, the data, the data they access. So I invite you to visit the web pages also because there are funding opportunities for innovators available. There's a page on the ngi.eu uh, portal. I shared with you on the, on the chat um, the, the, the URL. Um, you will find a number of open calls. And these open calls have specific um, uh, focus on some technologies and some specific areas. Um, and uh, European-based companies can apply for funding. But there is also a couple of projects that are looking at um, creating closer synergies with the United States. So there are two projects that are building up bridges um, and they are dedicated to uh, also fund uh, exchanges for students or for researchers and innovators that are working on these topics. So I would kindly invite you to look at the, at the um, portal and see uh, whether the NGI can also uh, help you realizing your changes for a better web. Well, thank you so much, Malik, Monique Kalisti from the Next Generation Internet. You can find them online at ngi.eu. And uh, we really appreciate having you here. Next up is um, Albert Kim. Albert Kim is with Noetic Nomads. They're our partner in putting this together. What's up, Albert? Uh, thank you so much, David. So great to be here. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here today. And a great big hug and shout out to all the amazing people who helped put together this amazing event. I'm Albert Kim, founder of Noetic Nomads, a community of radical thinkers and doers coming together to co-create a more beautiful future. Now, very much like what's happening today with our inaugural Overweb Challenge event. Now, uh, the genesis of this gathering was actually a People Need People session I attended in early November, hosted by one of our upcoming panelists, the incredible Nora Bateson. Uh, and I was grouped in the very first breakout room with two people, one of whom was David Benjamin. And we got talking and David brought up this thing he was working on called the Overweb. Now, the Overweb, it sounded uh, really intriguing. So we agreed to speak about the Overweb on the Noetic Nomads uh, podcast, which had just launched uh, the previous month. And now here we are two months later and we have an entire virtual festival dedicated to the future of the web, uh, to sense making and of digital communities in general. Um, so, I mean, I, I see today's event as like not the culmination of a long series of events, but a point of departure, uh, a new beginning of something more wonderful. And I hope to see lots of new ideas, connections and projects spring forth from today's events and our various panels. Uh, projects which I hope make a real difference and help bring into being the more beautiful world we know in our hearts is possible. Now, I'm looking forward to helping hold this space for us to dialogue on important issues of the moment, such as digital communities, the state of the web and sense making on the web, AI ethics and uh, people of color combating false claims, as well as having a first of its kind session on the ontological design of the web itself. So again, thanks so much everyone for being part of this special event and hope to see you all soon at our very first panel on the future of digital communities at 10 a.m. Pacific. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. All right, well, and I'm gonna thank you so much, Albert, and I'm gonna put it on to Fasa. There you are, brother. Yeah, um, thank the uh, panelists again, like we have a, a group of just really strong individuals that are working on some really great things that are going to shape the future. Um, uh, yeah, just the, the, the biggest thing about what it is that we're embarking on is that after 2020, we are just, we're in a place where we need to consider, you know, what we're using and what has control over our time and our minds and uh, building a web 
that actually uh, works for us instead of we working, us working for it is a, uh, it's just something that we're really excited about and something that every person should be excited about. And uh, I'm just really excited about our panelists because of the, uh, the level of expertise that they have and uh, how we will be able to find uh, new solutions working with these people to, uh, you know, like how can this over web pattern be used to create a better society? So I'm not gonna talk too much. I'm excited to get, them to, to get down to the, uh, the gritty stuff. So that's it. Well, you were, you were going to go ahead and talk about how we've already started applying the overweb pattern to education. Okay, well, uh, yeah, no, my apologies. I thought that that was a little bit later, but no, just the, uh, we've actually, uh, in the educational space, we've worked with and virtual salons with uh, over 100 uh, educators, teachers, faculty members, uh, uh, administrators, and even students to be able to work on a project called School. Um, School is a, uh, is a new platform that uses the overweb pattern to create a visible learning opportunity for students. So you can actually see thinking made visible on an actual web page where the source material is. Uh, this is something that will improve executive function in students and in kids. Uh, this is something that will improve character education in kids as well. And with what's happening in today's environment with the hybrid learning and with the uh, distance learning, we're seeing that a lot of great kids are falling behind as a result of that. Uh, another example is uh, the uh, Black Browser Project. The Black Browser Project is uh, the concept of a digital community where you have a group of people that have been uh, regulated as uh, consumers for a long period of time and to be able to create an opportunity for those individuals to, uh, to, to have a browser that speaks to the context and to the things that are important to that community. Currently right now with the web and the way that it's currently functioning, if, you, uh, if you're somebody of color and you interact with the web, there's not a whole lot on there, uh, at least from a technology standpoint, that interacts with your best interests. So, uh, that's something that is uh, also extremely important is to create an equitable browser, something that would allow for all groups of people to be able to have, uh, to be able to have the same type of equity and digital uh, sovereignty uh, whenever they use the web or something as powerful as the internet as well. And these are, and these concepts, these, uh, these different platforms, these different uh, ways that somebody may use the web can apply across all sectors. So how could the overweb pattern be used for health? How could it be used for social justice? How could it be used to combat racism? How could it be used in a number of different ways? And this is why uh, the purpose of the overweb challenge is to get, uh, to get everybody on the same page and recognize that we have a new tool in our bag that we can use and uh, understanding how to do that means that we need to bring the right people to the table. Absolutely. All right. Well, next on, we're going to bring up uh, Michaela and Stefan of the school user experience and design team. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Michaela. Um, I'm one of the UX design co-leads for school, which is an application of the Overweb. And I will pass it off to Stefan to kind of talk about our team, and then I'll also share my screen. All right, let's see here. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yeah, I see it. Perfect. Cool. So thank you, Michaela. And uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here this morning. If you're in the West Coast or evening, if you're in Europe like me, uh, my name is Stefan, and uh, I am a co-lead co of the UX and UI design team at School, together with Michaela. Um, we are we are so happy to be here, and so glad that David and Fossa already gave a little bit uh, a, hunch, a hint, like uh, uh, about School and about what it is. We want to talk you a little bit more about it. This is basically a first living version um, of the Overweb application and its design team 
which is composed of junior designers working on a product that could quite frankly change so many things in the way we think about schooling and learning. Uh, this is our team. You can see us on the screen. Mikel and I slid into the UX coordinator role this month and have this uh, great pleasure to work with this dedicated team. Uh, we come from all backgrounds and time zones, as you might see, uh, which sometimes uh, leaves us with the impression that we're working in shifts. And uh, we work, of course, we try to work in parallel with the developers, uh, the developer team from Accelerant, who are, uh, who are of course, working on front-end and back-end solution for the, for the presence platform. Um, we basically, we are all here uh, at the beginning of our careers, we're all, we're all like stepping into UX and UI from other jobs and other backgrounds. And uh, th this is definitely a great opportunity, you know, to, uh, to complement each other and to work together on uh, such an exciting project. Um, I would like to like conclude this part by, by a call to action, which is what we often do as designers. Um, we are always looking to welcome new volunteers. And if you know anyone who has a previous experience in UX, UI, or is currently studying it, or is looking for a new opportunity that would like be a step into this new career direction, uh, let them know that we are here and that we are uh, always there and ready to onboard new members and tell them about school. Uh, so, uh, our team culture, as I said, just briefly, most of the people in our team are transitioning uh, into UX, UI and growing together. Uh, that means that we have no strict hierarchies and everyone has an equal place around the table. Uh, we brainstorm, uh, we put forward ideas and concepts and propose solutions, and there is uh, absolutely, there are uh, no limitations in that regard. As junior designers, uh, we all rely on one another and complement one uh, each other with uh, different skill sets that we bring into this team. Uh, be it um, I don't know graphic design, uh, be it user research, uh, animations, prototyping, you name it. So we're all uh, happy to be there and learn uh, from each other. Uh, about school, um, as was already mentioned, school is uh, like the first practical application of the over web concept that David was talking about uh, during the introduction. Uh, and this is why we feel a bit like pioneers, you know, which, uh, which makes it all the more exciting. Um, on page learning and bridges, uh, which, uh, and Michaela will later uh, tell you a bit more about what bridges are and how they're being built. And they're like the innovations that enable a participative um, educational environment. Um, we will later also discuss the first uh, feature, the bridging challenge, the first school feature that, uh, that, uh, that's a concept that you'll be able, to, and then you'll be able to see uh, what is exactly that we're working on right now. But I wanted to take a step back and uh, tell you that uh, the idea behind this, behind school, is this goes beyond motivating students who are remote schooling right now because of COVID or for other reasons, uh, or uh, regular schooling, you know, once when this whole crisis uh, comes to an end, or offering them, it's not about offering them like a gamified version of curriculum. Uh, the idea is to convey the value of critical thinking and show them the layers of concept, the layers of knowledge that are behind any piece of content that you can find on the web. Uh, and this all with the aim to equip them with a skill set uh, that they will definitely need in their later lives. And this is how to discern reliable from unreliable sources when you're looking for information online. So, so Michaela, to... over to you, oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> All good, thank you. So this ties into Bridges and David was talking a little bit about this. Basically Bridges are just connections between any two pieces of information or content found on the internet. So um, you can see in this example that content can be images, it can be audio clips, it can be video clips, it can be really anything. So if you're on a Wikipedia page and um, you're reading a sentence, you can link that to a piece of a YouTube video that you're seeing. And ultimately these explain relationships. They could be supporting or conflicting um, and like Stefan was saying, it's just boosting critical thinking and connection skills. So 
Um, if this seems a little bit abstract, I'll give some specific examples. Um, so in a middle school context, if a teacher was um, preparing her eighth graders for class debate on if the voting age should be changed or not, um, the teacher could split their students into teams to build bridges. And this can just help their students think critically about the topic that they're going to debate um, and kind of formulate their stance um, for their argument. Um, in terms of voting also, so kind of outside of a school context, if people are preparing for an upcoming election and they're not necessarily sure who to vote for or they wanna think more critically about the issues of uh, the upcoming election, they can use those smart tags, click on a smart tag that is about the upcoming election, look at bridges that are showing supporting information, conflicting information uh, for different news sources and just consider critically who they're gonna vote for based on that. Um, in kind of a higher education setting, if a college student was uh, making a research paper Creating bridges could really help them to fact check different sources and uh, organize their information into specific topics and categories. Uh, those are just a few examples, but like Tavid was saying, um, if you're a skier or uh, if you're into health and you wanna research some sort of uh, thing revolving around a health condition, these are all different ways you can use bridges. Um, and that kind of leads into the work that our UX team is currently doing, which is uh, we're working on the bridging challenge. Concept. So basically this is taking bridging to um, still a learning environment, but it's a more competitive uh, focused atmosphere and we call it a knowledge sport. It's basically applying bridges and thinking critically, but in a more competition setting. So how it works is host create challenges revolving around categories and these categories could be anything from climate change to racial equity, really the, the options are un, unlimited. Um, and then bridgers join the challenge and they create bridges. And there's also an idea to add a video entry um, for teams kind of explaining and practicing presentation skills, uh, talking about why bridgers made the bridges they did for this challenge. Ultimately judges who are kind of skilled in that category are able to judge the bridges and award prizes um, based on how thought-provoking bridges are and uh, just how knowledge boosting they are. So in a school setting, we see this as teachers being the hosts of bridging challenges um, and kind of organizing challenges with their classrooms, with their school. And then at a larger scale, we're seeing um, hopefully anyone can participate in the challenge um, and create a challenge as well. And more specifically, what we're working on, uh, we're working with the Accelerant developer team um, to create a design system and content style guide. We're currently working on a high fidelity prototype for the challenge, and we're gonna test with uh, real teachers and real students to gain feedback. Um, so we're currently working on that and then explaining the value of bridges, uh, figuring out a way to explain this in visual format through video, also through graphics, just to appeal to all different learning styles. And then at the end of the day, we want this to be a fun, engaging platform for students. Um, so we're focusing on how to make it interactive, adding gamification elements and uh, including fun colors and just all those things like that. So yes, thank you, Michaela. And uh, this will be uh, our conclusion for today. We wanted, to, uh, we wanted you all to take a look at the roadmap. Uh, so we're currently nearing the end of our proof of concept of Bridger.Live and we are all as a team looking forward to uh, the next school year and uh, we are really, really, really excited that it, would, it will not only be just like a huge professional satisfaction for all of us, but also an important step uh, in making school more useful and more practical and uh, the internet altogether uh, less flat and richer in content. Uh, this is basically this is basically what we had for you today. I'm taking it back to David, and of course, I would be really, really glad to connect with everyone and uh, stay in touch after this after this challenge. Yes, well, thank you both, Stefan and Michaela. Really appreciate you all coming through. For the next couple of minutes, we're going to have Matthew Bateman talking about the uh, work that we've been doing around um, fact checking and false claims in the media. So Hi everyone, I'm Matthew. I'm out here in sunny Seattle. Not quite, but it is what it is. Can you all hear me okay? Is everything? Yeah. 
Great. So I originally came across David in a messaging box around um, a similar topic, and I was I asked him, made the mistake of asking him, whether or not there was any other projects involving this open source information and transparency. And uh, he has a lot of the answers there. And that's how I got roped into this, which has been a lot of fun. We've been working on a project called Citizen Fact, which is a way of having a looking at that social layer and bringing people engaged to either want to question uh, facts that they see stated or have their own sort of knowledge of original sources um, and bring that together so that we can have a social engagement and not quite a crowdsourced way of finding information, but something that's a little bit better than um, for my goals, it's a little bit better than what we have right now. My background academically is with how we create language to either include or exclude demographics. And professionally, I work with um, the governments, uh, our state governments, uh, vaccine security task force. And a lot of our work relies on open source intelligence, finding out, yes, information that is publicly available, matching certain criteria and whether or not we can take action within critical infrastructures based on that. So that's another level of absolute trust that we need in order to operate. And I'm hoping that we can apply these concepts of the overweb to this open source intelligence that my constituents have to use on a regular basis. All right, thank you, Matthew. Really appreciate you coming through.